as we finish the upper quarter or upper extremity, we end with the wrist and the hand. Um, <laughs> I always like to see these skateboarders because they always end up uh, fracturing their wrist or their hand or and uh, I love the guy that you know he's he's got the camera right there I wonder what his facial expression is like but this is this is very uh, common uh, many sport activities require precise functioning of the wrist and hand archery bowling golf baseball tennis require the combined use of wrist and hand joints Relate functional anatomy to the joint actions. Uh, well, you can do flexion, extension, abduction, adduction of the wrist and hand. There's 29 bones, more than 25 joints, more than 30 muscles, of which 18 are intrinsic, meaning they just stay within the hand. The wrist and hand contain 29 bones, including the radius and the ulna. Eight carpal bones and two rows of bones form the wrist. Five metacarpal bones, numbered one to five from the thumb. So these are great little quiz questions. How many bones? How many carpal bones? There's 14 phalanxes, digits, three for each phalanx except the thumb, which has only two, proximal, middle, and distal. The thumb has a sesamoid bone in its flexor tendon. Other sesamoids may occur in the fingers. You have eight carpal bones. Uh, the proximal row from the radius to the ulna. So the little mnemonic that I remember is some lovers try positions. So scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform. So scaphoid is the most commonly fractured. Okay. So it's a good quiz question. Which is the most commonly uh, fractured carpal bone? And that's the scaphoid. You fall on an outstretched ham to foosh injury. Uh, you don't wear wrist guards. That can happen. The distal row is trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So that they can't handle. So again, the mnemonic that I use to remember all these is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. So at least I know the beginning of each word and then I can kind of figure it out from there. So here, scaphoid is the most commonly injured from falling on the outstretched hand. Often dismissed as a sprain, uh, but causes significant problems if not recognized and treated properly because the blood supply to the scaphoid is very poor. So treatment often requires long periods of precise immobilization or surgery. Now the carpal bones form a three-sided arch, concave on the palmar side, bony arches spanned by the transverse carpal and volar carpal ligaments, creates the carpal tunnel, uh, frequently a source of problems known as carpal tunnel syndrome, and usually it's the median nerve that is impinged in carpal tunnel. Uh, medial epicondyle, medial epicondyle ridge and coronary process, point of origin for many wrist and finger flexors, lateral epicondyle and lateral ep supracondyle ridge, point of origin for many wrist and finger extensors. Okay, so knowing the difference between medial epicondyle and lateral epicondyle, and we covered uh, some of that in the elbow, so that's why I'm kind of going through this. Uh, but key distal bony landmarks for muscles involved wrist motion, the base of the second, third, and fifth metacarpals, pisiform, and hamate. Key insertion points for finger flexors are base of the first metacarpal, proximal, and distal phalanxes. Uh, so if you remember your anatomy uh, that classes, there's a lot of origin insertions that occur in these areas. So the wrist joint in general is a condyloid type joint. It allows for flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. Motion occurs primarily between the distal radius and the proximal carpal row, which consists of the scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrium, known as the radial culper joint. So what are the movements of the wrist? Well, the wrist does 70 to 90 degrees of flexion, 65 to 85 degrees of extension, 15 to 25 degrees of abduction, and 25 to 40 degrees of adduction. Each, each finger has three joints. That's your MCP joint, your proximal interphalangeal PIP joint, your distal interphalangeal DIP joint, uh, your MCP joints, uh, classified as condyloids, they have 0 to 40 degrees of extension, and they have 85 to 100 degrees of flexion. 
proximal interphalangeal PIP joints uh, classified as ginglimus, uh, full extension to approximately 90 to 100 degrees of flexion. So knowing these degrees is, is important. So if you have a patient that can't get these, then you know that, hey, we need to work on these degrees of flexion. Distal interferon DIP points classified as ginglimus. Uh, flexion 80 to 90 degrees from full extension. So that's your distal DIP joint. Oh, so if you look at this, this is RA versus OA. So RA, our rheumatoid arthritis, is systemic. So you're going to see deformities on both sides. Uh, there's no cure, unfortunately. But OA is what you and I will get from just old age. That's just wear and tear of the joints. So that's the difference. So if you have pain in both knees, both ankles, both hips, your spine, everything hurts. That's more indicative of RA. But if you have just pain in the right knee, right ankle, right hip, uh, then that's more indicative of OA. Uh, joints in general, the thumb has two joints. Uh, the metacarpal phalangeal joint, so full extension into 40 to 90 degrees of flexion, classified as ginglimus. Now the opposable thumb is what make, distinguishes us from uh, other primates uh, like we discussed and if you lose 40 percent of function if you lose your thumb okay so the interphalangeal IP joint flexes 80 to 90 degrees the CMC joint of the thumb unique saddle type joint uh, it does 50 to 70 degrees of abduction uh, flexes approximately 15 to 45 degrees and extends zero to 20 degrees humans versus primates look at that so you look at the the look at the thumb here and you look at the thumb on primates so the opposable thumb is basically what makes us different okay movements you have wrist flexion and extension you have abduction and adduction fingers flexions and extension uh, MCP joints abduct and adduct. So middle phalange is a reference point to differentiate between abduction and adduction. So the index and middle fingers abduct when they move laterally toward the radial side of the hand. Ring and little fingers adduct when they move medially toward the ulnar side of the hand. Medial movement of the ring finger and little fingers is adduction. Okay. And lateral movements of the ring finger and little finger toward the radial side is a deduction. So make sure, make sure you know the difference between a deduction and a deduction. So here's a nice little diagram that shows the reference point. So that's wrist flexion. That's finger flexion. That's wrist extension. That's finger extension. That's wrist abduction or also radial deviation. And that's phalangeal abduction away from the fingers. And this is adduction or ulnar deviation or ulnar flexion toward the ulna. Movements toward the middle finger, that's adduction. So adduction, ulnar flexion, movement of the little finger side to the hand toward the medial aspect of the or the ulnar side of the forearm. Movement of fingers toward the middle finger. Opposition, movement of the thumb across the palmar aspect to oppose any or all of the phalanges. Reposition, movement of the thumb as it returns to the anatomical position from opposition with hand and or fingers. All right, the muscles. You have extrinsic muscles of the wrist and hand are grouped according to the function and location. Uh, there's six muscles that move the wrist, but not the fingers and the thumb. So the three wrist flexors, and this is important for you to understand because this is a two joint muscle. That's the flexor carpi radialis and the flexor carpi ulnaris and the palmaris longus. The Three wrist extensors are the extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, and the extensor carpi ulnaris. 
There's nine muscles are the primary movers of the phalanges, um, also involved in wrist joint actions, generally weaker in their wrist actions. So the flexors are flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus, flexor pollicis longus, which is a thumb flexor. So the extensors are extensor digitorum, extensor indices, extensor digiti minimi, extensor pollicis longus, thumb extensor, extensor pollicis brevis, thumb extensor, abductor of the thumb and wrist, and abductor pollicis longus. All wrist flexors generally have their origins on the anterior medial aspect of the proximal forearm and the medial condyle of the humerus with insertions on the anterior aspect of the wrist and hand. Median nerve in all flexor tendons except the flexor carpi ulnaris and palmaris longus pass through the carpal tunnel. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, what is it? It's swelling and inflammation can cause increased pressure in the carpal tunnel resulting in decreased function of the median nerve leading to reduced motor and sensory function of its distribution. Uh, very common with repetitive use of hand and wrist in manual labor, clerical work, data entry, typing, keyboarding. Uh, often slight modifications in work habits and hand and wrist positions during these activities can be preventative. Uh, there's some flexibility exercises for the wrist and fingers. Flexors may be helpful. Wrist extensors generally have their origins on the posterior lateral aspect of the proximal forearm and lateral humeral epicondyle with insertions located on the posterior aspect of the wrist and hand, uh, important stabilizing the wrist in extension while the finger flexors contract in gripping. Flexor and extensor tendons immediately proximal to the wrist are held in place on the palmar aspect and dorsal aspects by transverse bands of tissue known as flexor and extensor retinaculum respectively to prevent the tendons from bowstringing, right? So if you were to flex and all of a sudden all the tendons were just to kind of uh, pop out, that'd be a problem. So the flexor retinaculum really helps with that. Um, the wrist AB ductors generally cross the wrist joint anterolaterally and posteriorly to insert on the radial side. So those are AB ductors. Uh, flexor carpi radialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis longus, and extensor po pollicis means thumb. So and you know that's on the radial side. The wrist AD ductors cross the uh, joint anteromedially and posteromedially to insert on the ulnar side of the hand. And that's the flexor carpi ulnaris and extensor carpi ulnaris. Oh, the intrinsics. That means just in the hand. Intrinsic hand muscles have origins and insertions on the bones of the hand only. So the radial side, you have four muscles of the thumb, opponent's pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis, and AD ductor pollicis. Ulnar side, three muscles of the little finger, opponent's digiti mini, remember Dr. Evil, <laughs> abductor digiti minimi, and flexor digiti minimi brevis. And the remainder of the hand, you have 11 different muscles. You have four lumbricals, three palmar inner osseae, and four dorsal inner osseae. All right.